Señoras y señores, sentados. Tiene la palabra la profesora doctora doña María Marcos González, secretaria general de la Universidad de Alcalá, para dar lectura al acuerdo del claustro por el que se dispone el nombramiento del doctor Honoris Causa. Como secretaria general de la Universidad, doy fe de que el claustro de la Universidad de Alcalá, en su sesión de 25 de noviembre de 2020, acordó conferir la suprema dignidad de doctor Honoris Causa al excelentísimo señor don Robert Rich. Así consta en el acta original al que me remito y a cuya vista expido el presente testimonio con el visto bueno del señor rector. El padrino se servirá a conducir y acompañar a presencia de todos los claustrales aquí reunidos al candidato a grado de doctor. Tiene la palabra el profesor doctor don Miguel Ángel Teus Guezala, catedrático de oftalmología de la Universidad de Alcalá y padrino de don Robert Rich para pronunciar la laudatio. Rector de la Universidad de Alcalá, Vicerrector de Investigación y Transferencia, Secretaria General, Doctor Rich, miembros del equipo de gobierno, decanos, directores de escuela y presidenta del Consejo de Estudiantes, miembros de la comunidad universitaria, señoras y señores. Es para mí un privilegio tener la oportunidad con que nuestra universidad me obsequia de encargarme de la laudatio del doctor Robert Rich. Asimismo, creo que toda la universidad, la facultad de medicina y especialmente el área de oftalmología están de enhorabuena el día de hoy. Estamos de enhorabuena porque la oftalmología de nuestra universidad, esa área de conocimiento que versa sobre un órgano de tamaño menudo, como es el ojo, tiene a una de sus enfermedades crónicas más frecuentes e invalidantes, el glaucoma, como una de sus principales líneas de investigación. En este campo del glaucoma es al que el doctor Rich ha dedicado su actividad profesional y académica. Este vínculo de la Universidad de Alcalá con el glaucoma no es reciente, viene de antiguo. 
Así, una de las primeras descripciones detalladas de esta enfermedad realizadas en lengua castellana, en la que el autor, de forma y manera prolijas, describe la dolencia que él mismo sufría, se la debemos a un antiguo alumno de esta universidad, don Bernardino de Mendoza, también conocido como Bernardino el Ciego. Don Bernardino, en el siglo XVI, obtuvo en este mismo Paraninfo y desde esta misma cátedra desde la que les hablo hoy, su grado de licenciado en Arte y Filosofía. Bernardino fue, como muchos de los alumnos egresados de esta noble alma mater, alto funcionario del reino, sirviendo a nuestro rey don Felipe II en varios cargos de relevancia, destacando sobremanera el de embajador en el reino de, del reino de España en Inglaterra en tiempos de Isabel I, planeando sin duda la futura expedición de la grande y felicísima armada, que desafortunadamente nada tuvo de invencible. Pues bien, Bernardino nos describe en sus cartas personales, con todo lujo de detalles, los síntomas oculares que padeció en su vejez y que a la postre le llevaron a la ceguera. Los síntomas, en mi docta opinión, son del todo compatibles con un glaucoma secundario. ¿Quién sabe si quizá, y dado el origen vascongado de la noble familia Alcarreña de los Mendoza, apellido que, como es bien sabido, procede del vascuence Mendi Ocha, o Montefrío, se tratara de un glaucoma exfoliativo, variante esta mucho más prevalente en el norte que en el resto de España. El doctor Rich no es solamente un experto en glaucoma, ni tan solo una personalidad interna internacionalmente reconocida en este campo. El doctor Rich es una auténtica leyenda. Es una leyenda pues sus logros en las diversas vertientes y facetas que, estimo, deben conformar a un verdadero magíster son extraordinarios. El doctor Rich ha destacado como investigador, en el sentido más estricto del término, es decir, creador de conocimiento, pues él ha sabido en muchas ocasiones ver y describir hechos que los demás, aunque miraban en la misma dirección, no percibían. De esta manera, sus hallazgos e hipótesis sobre el glaucoma, singularmente el vinculado con el síndrome de exfoliación capsular, también conocido como glaucoma pseudoexfoliativo, han sido seminales. No se puede explicar de otra manera que su índice H alcance la cifra de 83. Este nivel de citaciones de sus publicaciones científicas, más de 816, avala el carácter legendario de nuestro doctorando en el campo del glaucoma. Además, el doctor Rich ha destacado sobremanera en la actividad docente, aspecto este fundamental para todo magíster que se precie de ello. Vinculada siempre a la Facultad de Medicina y al New York Eye and Ear Infirmary, ahora parte del Hospital Montesinaí de la ciudad de Nueva York. Hospital este último histórico, fundado en 1852 para atender originalmente a pacientes judíos sin medios económicos de la ciudad. En este centro eh, fue donde el doctor Rich se formó a finales de los años 70 del siglo pasado como oftalmólogo. Los más de 160 fellows por él entrenados, eh, en la institución antes citada son uno de los ejemplos más claros de lo que les digo. Pero un auténtico maestro debe desarrollar otra faceta fundamental y es la accesibilidad, la accesibilidad para con sus colaboradores, pares y discípulos. En este sentido, el doctor Rich es sencillamente sorprendente. En escasas horas responde a los correos electrónicos y da consejo, siempre acertado y desinteresado, cuando algún investigador que le sea próximo se lo solicita, especialmente si se trata de alguna investigación sobre glaucoma. Doy fe de ello. ¿Y qué decir de las obras de divulgación oftalmológica, por ejemplo, los libros de texto? Les confesaré que tan solo hay un libro en mi biblioteca oftalmológica cuyo lomo, desgastado y descolorido, da fe de la pasión e intensidad con la que fue leído, así como de las altas temperaturas que, en nuestro país, en verano y en la playa, humedecen inevitablemente las manos del estudioso que, hechizado por la claridad y profundidad del texto, no es capaz de dejar su lectura para otra ocasión. Me refiero al icónico Rich and Shells, The Secondary Glaucomas, edición de 1982. Este libro, estoy seguro, ha provocado la inclinación al glaucoma de muchos residentes de oftalmología de la época, no solamente la mía. Por estos motivos y por muchos más, el doctor Rich ha hecho suyo el lema de esta medalla. Perfundet omnia luce. A todos ilumina con su luz. En otro orden de cosas, quiero destacar también que el doctor Rich es miembro de nada menos que de 45 sociedades científicas, en muchas de ellas como miembro de honor, y de varios clubs, entre los que destaca el Club Atlético de Nueva York. 
Por último, a mis doctorandas aquí presentes, les reitero hoy lo que en varias ocasiones les he repetido. Buscad en vuestro desarrollo profesional y académico un modelo de conducta a imitar. No os dejéis seducir por los cantos de sirena que, proviniendo de, pers de personajes medianos, más prontos y dispuestos al descanso y al solaz que al trabajo bien hecho, son desafortunadamente tan abundantes y frecuentes. Conducíos en la profesión siempre sobre el camino, en el camino de la excelencia. En este sentido, doctorandas mías, laboris causa, el doctor Rich creo que es uno de los mejores modelos a imitar que podíais encontrar. En virtud de los, de los méritos indicados y del acuerdo tomado por el claustro de la Universidad de Alcalá, solicito al señor rector que se proceda a la investidura de, del doctor don Robert Rich como doctor honoris causa por esta universidad. He dicho. Se va a proceder a tomar juramento o promesa a don Robert Rich, candidato al grado de doctor. Robert Rich, acercaos para prestar con la más plena conciencia el juramento o promesa que os voy a tomar en nombre de la universidad. ¿Juráis o prometéis solemnemente? por vuestra conciencia y honor, defender y respetar todos los derechos, privilegios y honores de esta universidad, así como favorecerla y ayudarla cuantas veces se os demande? Se va a proceder a la solemne colación del título de doctor honoris causa a don Robert Rich. La Universidad de Alcalá, en reconocimiento de vuestros relevantes méritos, os ha nombrado doctor honoris causa. Como testimonio de esta dignidad, en virtud de la autoridad que como rector me está conferida, os entrego el título de doctor. Además, os impongo el birrete laureado, símbolo de tan alto honor, llevadlo sobre vuestra cabeza como corona de vuestros estudios y merecimientos. Recibid ahora, de manos de vuestro padrino, los restantes atributos de este nombramiento y distinción. A saber, el libro de la ciencia, que es preciso cultivéis y difundáis, y que os ha de servir como aviso de que, por grandes que sean vuestros talentos, siempre deberéis manifestar reverencia, respeto, y consideración a quienes fueron vuestros maestros. El anillo eh, que en los pasados tiempos se entregaba en esta solemne ceremonia como emblema del privilegio de firmar y sellar los dictámenes, consultas y arbitrajes de vuestra ciencia y profesión. Y los guantes blancos, símbolo de la pureza que deben conservar vuestras manos 
y signo de vuestra dignidad. Tiene la palabra el excelentísimo señor don Robert Rich para pronunciar su discurso de ingreso en este claustro. All right, thank you. Uh, it's my great pleasure and honor to be receiving here this Dr. Sanders Causa from the University of Alcala. <coughs> I'd like to thank especially Professor Miguel Tus for nominating me, Professor Vicente Sanz, rector of the university, Professor Marcos Gonzalez, and Professor Quinero Serrano for their kindness and detailed instructions on getting me out of New York and into Spain, which uh, in this area of COVID is uh, not the easiest thing to do. I never saw so many forms to fill up before. Uh, I'm indebted to everyone's assistance on getting me out of New York and into Spain. Uh, you know, normally I'd make about 10 trips a year, but uh, because of the COVID, I haven't been on a plane for a year and a half, and so I had almost forgotten how to get through an airport and get onto a plane. Uh, my last time in Madrid was when I graduated from college, which I hate to say is about 50 years ago. Uh, and so I'm very really glad to be back here. My favorite memory from back then was having paella in the Plata Mayor. Uh, I'm looking forward to it again. Uh, tomorrow I'm going to give a talk about exfoliation syndrome. That's been my major interest throughout my career, one of my major interests. Today I was asked to speak about something autobiographical, and I find that harder to do. It's harder to talk about myself than it is to talk about an eyeball. A major point, I want to make a major point for the younger people in the audience. I assume there's some residents and fellows here. Uh, Look, I've made, I've done a lot of things in my life, and I've made a lot of mistakes. And I'm going to talk about both of them because they serve as a lesson. I think it's a very important lesson for the younger people in the audience here. I started my career in cell biology in the 1960s. I hadn't planned at that time to go to medical school. And at that time, the field was just burgeoning. I took a... Uh, course in my junior year under Keith Porter, and he and George Pilati had invented the electron microscope when he was at Rockefeller University before he moved up to Harvard. Uh, that was the most exciting course I'd ever taken. I sat down the first lecture, I was just totally captivated. And this was at a time, this was the mid-1960s, I don't want to uh, claim to be that old, but this was the mid-1960s, and everything was new. Every day they were describing mitochondria, synapses, synaptic vesicles, the altar structure of cilia and flagella, uh, Golgi apparatus, and many, many other things. The whole cell was now being described with electron microscopy the first time. And it was almost impossible to find not to, it was impossible not to find something new when you got onto the microscope and started looking. So the day after I took the, my first lecture in that course, I was up in his office and I said, I want to work with him. I wanted to do my senior thesis with him and he accepted me and I spent three years with Keith Porter. And he, was, he was really a great man. He was a gentleman, a superb teacher. He became the most important mentor I had had before or since. 
and his, he was enthusiastic about everything. Whenever he talked, he would say, oh, yesterday I called up Alex Rich over at MIT, and he sent this slide over, and here's the first picture ever of rotary shadow DNA. He was always showing the first picture that he had gotten from somebody, and he knew everybody. So his enthusiasm was very contagious, and his support was really valuable for all his undergraduate and graduate students. Now, my first paper was in 1969, and that was the first identification of repeating particles. We saw these particles on, a, on the surface of a membrane. We didn't realize at that time exactly what they were, but it was the first, we realized that it was the first electron micrographic visualization of a single molecule, but we didn't know what molecule it was. And we didn't realize the importance of the whole thing until the following year when we did negative counter staining of these microtubules that were in the gills of fish that pumped sodium. They were associated somehow with sodium transport. And we, we counterstained them with lanthanum, and the lanthanum showed up black in the images and extended across the plasma membrane. Now, this is the mid-1960s. The unit, the concept of the uh, plasma membrane was the unit membrane, David Robertson's unit membrane theory, and the proteins were on the outside, proteins on the inside, and a lipid bilayer in between them. And that plasma membrane served to close off the inside of the cell from the outside world. Uh, and that was, that was uh, dogma at that time. Um, my favorite thing throughout my life has been overthrowing theories that people have believed in for 50 years. I've done it a few times. Uh, so the, I, I got really excited when I saw the lanthanum going through the membrane. I went to the guy that I was working on. Uh, now I was on a Harvard fellowship at Rice working with the uh, person I had worked with at Harvard when he was a postdoc. And I said, hey, Bill, look, take a look at these pictures. The, the lanthanum was going through the membrane. We have just discovered the sodium pore. Okay? This is the, we've discovered the first transmembrane protein. And there goes the Robertson unit membrane theory. But this, is, this has got to be the sodium pore. And he looked at me and he said, well, you know, uh, it looks nice, but nobody's going to believe it. Uh, so he didn't want me to, he didn't let me publish it. He thought nobody was going to believe it. Six years later, somebody else discovered it and got an award. And I never forgot that. That taught me a lesson that if I believe in something, I've got to fight for it. And that's the point I want to make to the younger people in the audience today. This occurred a second time. The second time this occurred, I was a second year resident on a pediatrics rotation in medical school, and they had admitted a baby with Zellweger syndrome for a liver biopsy. And I said, I want a piece of the biopsy for electron microscopy. And they said, we know what the diagnosis is. We don't, you don't need any biopsy for electron microscopy. We're doing this as a formality. I said, look, nobody's ever looked at Zellweger's. Nobody knows what it's about. Uh, the, the best pictures there are are poor light microscope histology. I want a piece for electron microscopy. They said, kid, get out of here. Go away. We know what we're doing. I said, I'm not going away until I get a piece of that liver. And I stood there, and I got a piece of the liver. And when we looked at it, it turned out to be the first, uh, first known disease with no peroxisomes in the cells. This was the whole beginning of a whole area of peroxisomal diseases. Uh, and at this point, there was my first, that was my first paper in science also. So they stopped telling me to shut up and get away uh, and started giving me more biopsies to do. Uh, 
For the younger people in the audience, this is what I want to say. This is what I learned from this. If you have an idea and you believe in it, then do it. Okay? Don't let people talk you out of it and tell, it, tell you it's a dumb idea or it's not worth doing. Because if nobody knows what the answer is, then all they're doing is guessing when they tell you not to do it. Uh, if you don't, if you have really believe in something and you don't do it, and somebody else does it five years later, as somebody did with the Robertson unit membrane theory and the, uh, the uh, trans, uh, transplasmolemal uh, proteins in the sodium pump, if somebody does it five years later and gets an award, you feel bad. If you do something and it doesn't work, okay, it doesn't work. Go on and do something else. But at least you tried. It's better to have loved, who was it, Shakespeare maybe said, it's better to have loved and lost than never to have loved at all. Somebody said it anyway. So if you have an idea and you believe in it, find a way to do it. And if you have an, and you have an idea and you believe in it and it doesn't work, then you go on and do something else. But at least you went ahead and tried to do it. So don't let other people tell you something is not going to work. Let your own head tell you whether or not something is going to work. Now, during my residency, I was lucky. I rotated through a clinic that had patients from all over the world, so all six continents. And at that time, glaucoma was basically divided into open angle and angle closure glaucoma. And angle closure glaucoma was supposed to be the most common angle, most common glaucoma in Asia. And it was. It was more common than open angle glaucoma in China, more common than POAG. And I was really interested in gonioscopy. I mean, I loved it. I took to it right away, bam. Uh, and I worked out a four-step four uh, diagram, a four-step classification of angle closure glaucoma based on the anatomic configurations which I had seen after iridotomy. I did the first laser iridotomy in New York when I was a fellow. Uh, the person I was working for said, don't do it, it's not going to work. I said, why? He said, well, he tried it and it didn't work. I said, look, if you tried it and it didn't work, doesn't mean that I'm going to try it and it's not going to work. And I got it to work and I got 100% success after about my first five cases. And what I noticed was that when you did a surgical iridectomy, you pulled the eye apart. You couldn't tell afterwards. They, they gave the patients dilating drops. With, with a laser iridotomy, you could just make a hole, get rid of pupillary block, and see what was left. And so I divided on the basis of the anatomic configuration of the angle after iridotomy into levels, descending levels of pupillary block Plateau iris, which was thought to be very rare, but really wasn't very rare, as I showed later on. Lens-induced angle closure, and then malignant glaucoma. Um, and then when I, when I did that, after about five of them, I put into teaching a course on laser iridotomy at the American Academy of Ophthalmology. And uh, I, I hypothesized at that time that laser was going to take over, that there was no reason to cut open an eye and do a surgical iridectomy anymore. The laser iridotomy was going to be the whole future. But it wasn't until 1991 when I got the first ultrasound biomicroscope in the United States that I was able to prove anatomically the mechanisms that I had proposed about seven or eight years earlier, and I developed peripheral iridoplasty to treat patients with continued apositional closure after iridotomy had eliminated pupillary block. And this is the reason people thought 
uh, plateau iris was rare because they would do a surgical iridectomy, dilate the patient, then when the patient was dilated because of the plateau, they would get PAS, go on to need surgery and everything else. With just the iridotomy, you could see with four mirror indentation gonioscopy, and that's what's really important, four mirror indentation gonioscopy in a darkened room if you really want to tell what's going on in the angle. Otherwise, you cannot really assess the angle accurately. And with indentation gonioscopy, I could see that the angle was still closed, but appositionally closed. And it's really important to differentiate between PAS and appositional closure because PAS requires surgery uh, if you're going to get, try to get rid of them, like goniosynechiolysis. And appositional closure, all it required was more laser. And the way I approached it was by developing laser iridoplasty to get rid of the appositional closure. Now at this time, uh, I don't think I have one up here. Oh, here. Do you? Everybody got one of these? Uh, they were supposed to hand them out in the door. Look, this. This is. We don't have PowerPoint. Uh, this is all of angle. This is all of glaucoma on one slide. Okay. This is. Everything is up here, and up in the upper right, it says causative mechanisms. Well, nobody ever really paid attention to mechanisms. In the 1950s, and it took 100 years for them to accept this, it was in the 1950s that the American Academy of Ophthalmology finally conceded that, yes, there were two kinds of glaucoma, open angle and angle closure. And the concept of pupillary block had taken 30 years, it was de developed by Gifford in Kansas in 1923 or so. It took 30 years for people to accept pupillary block. Some people never accepted pupillary block. Uh, that's in the history books. So I said I love, always liked overthrowing theories. If you look up here, the very top line, this was glaucoma for 100 years. Okay, you had X, Y, and Z were risk factors, which were actually secondary glaucomas. So yeah, X is, let's say the X is exfoliation syndrome, the Y is uh, pigment dispersion, Z is myosilin glaucoma. But these, these factors, these risk factors, these are actually diseases. They're diseases in and of themselves, and they're different from each other but they would lead to blockage or dysfunction of the trabecular meshwork, which would lead to elevated pressure and lead to glaucomatous damage. And that was glaucoma. The pressure they call the pressure of 22 was glaucoma, 21 was in glaucoma. When I was training, people did not recognize normal tension glaucoma. The Europeans, fortunately, did. Americans didn't pay any attention to it, and uh, it was considered very rare. And I started wondering, why does every patient with normal tension glaucoma come in 95 years old, 90 years old, and they say, well, all my life my ophthalmologist has been telling me I'm fine, and then he said last week that I have acute normal tension glaucoma. Well, things didn't work that way. Obviously, they never looked earlier. If a patient came in and the pressure was 16, they said, okay, you're fine, go home, I'll see you next year. They didn't look at the optic disc. They didn't do visual fields. They missed normal tension glaucoma in younger people. Uh, and nobody had paid attention to the various mechanisms. Well, normal tension glaucoma is basically a disease of ischemia, decreased mean ocular perfusion pressure. And these X prime, Y prime, Z prime are considered risk factors for normal tension glaucoma. But these, what we called risk factors, are really diseases in and of themselves. Sleep apnea, atrial fibrillation, uh, peripheral vascular dysregulation, Flammer syndrome, which we, we named after Flammer retired and wrote up 
as a distinct disease. Nocturnal hypotension. There are risk factors for normal tension glaucoma. There are risk factors because they decrease the blood and the ocular perfusion and the oxygenation to the eye, but they're not just little factors floating around in space. They're actual, they're actual diseases. And when I trained, people didn't believe in normal tension glaucoma. Uh, it's really common. It's, uh, it's about a third of my practice. So I spent about 30 years, I got ex interested first in exfoliation. I spent about 30 years working on exfoliation. And in 1983, I started the Glaucoma Foundation. And then a couple of years later, we brought, we started the, an annual think tank, an optic nerve rescue and regeneration think tank. That's when we decided, right about then, 1992, 19, that was 1985, 1990. In that area, we decided that glaucoma was potentially treatable and preventable and could be approached by a number of different directions besides just lowering intraocular pressure. So we started this annual think tank, and what we did was bring together ophthalmologists and PhDs, we had more PhDs than MDs, uh, visual scientists, and people who were famous in their own fields, but never heard of glaucoma. And I wish I had more time to go deeper into this because, because it's a whole story in itself. But we, would, we started neuroprotection in the first one, just going on 27 years now. At the first think tank, we came up with the idea of neuroprotection for glaucoma. We did that for five years, and after five years, the speakers couldn't understand each other because the science had gotten too far ahead and we had to wait for it to catch up. So we moved on to molecular genetics and then other things like nanotechnology, uh, high resolution imaging, and every year we would try to take a glaucoma as a central focus but bring in people from other fields, people who didn't know anything about glaucoma, stem cells, uh, regeneration, and put them together and talk and talk for two days to try to come up with new ideas of how to put these ide different fields together to impinge and elucidate glaucoma and to make a new field. And this, will be the, this year will be the 27th uh, think tank that we've, that we've done. So, I started the think tank 27 years ago. For the past eight years, about eight years ago, we're not a huge foundation. We're not the National Eye Institute. We're a small foundation, relatively. We give away about three or four hundred thousand dollars a year in grants. And uh, we said, well, what can we do with the money we have that will make it some, an important impact on the field when the NEI is giving away a hundred million dollars and we certainly don't have, you know, we have a few hundred thousand dollars. Where can we make an impact? And the first thing I thought of was exfoliation. I had been giving lectures before this on exfoliation syndrome being a potentially preventable and reversible and someday even curable disease. And I said, let's just put all our effort into exfoliation syndrome. Uh, so that's what we've done for the past eight years. And exfoliation syndrome was really underdiagnosed. Uh, even more than, more than normal tension glaucoma, which was very, very underdiagnosed. In the US, they didn't care. In Japan and Asia, they diagnosed normal tension glaucoma. And everybody thought that exfoliation syndrome was a Scandinavian disease. I, when I was a first year resident, I had a fight with a professor because I was looking at a patient from Greece, and he said, what are you looking at? I said, exfoliation syndrome. And he looked and he said, well, she's from Greece. I said, yes, yeah, so what? He said, well, she's from Greece. She can't have exfoliation syndrome because it's a Scandinavian disease. Well, a few days later, I brought him several epidemiologic papers showing him ex exfoliation syndrome in Turkey and Greece and every place else. 
Uh, but it, it was really hard. People missed it. They didn't concentrate on it. They didn't look at it. And I'll, I'll talk about that tomorrow. So it was virtually underdiagnosed and ignored in the United States. Well, at that time, it, it was not it was it was not that well known in Europe either, except in Northern Europe. So we started the Lindbergh Society. We had all the people who were really interested in exfoliation who were publishing on it, which amounted to about 30 people. We started a society, uh, and then we met for a couple of years, but we didn't have anybody to, we wanted to do a big website and put everything up on a website. It didn't work. We didn't have enough people, anybody to work on the website, uh, so it fell by the wayside. But we're now, at the present time, we're restarting it because now, because of the think tank, we have over 100 people, not 30 in the world, but over 100 people doing uh, work on exfoliation syndrome. I mentioned that normal tension glaucoma was considered even rarer than exfoliation, and, and it's basically, as I mentioned, the disease of ischemia with these other uh, risk factors, which are diseases in themselves. Uh, and Raynaud's is very common. Raynaud's phenomenon, peripheral vascular dysregulation. There are a lot of biochemical abnormalities, elevated endothelin. And most of this work was done by Flammer in Switzerland. When Flammer retired two or three years ago, we decided to name it Flammer syndrome and wrote a paper. That's by uh, Olga Kaznevska. Uh, I can give a reference. Anybody write to me, uh, email me. I'll give you all the references you want. Uh, so now what do we have? We have elevated pressure at the top of the diagram, and that leads to high-tension glaucoma. And normal tension glaucoma is not a great term. It's falling out of favor. It, because the pressure's normal to begin with. Some people have low pressure. Some people have high normal pressure. 19, you know, this was all made up by statisticians in the 1950s. So if your pressure is somewhere between 12 and 21, it was called normal tension glaucoma. But people didn't diagnose it because if the pressure was 18, they didn't look at the optic nerve. They didn't do a visual field. Uh, and it comprises 90% of the glaucoma, the primary opening angle glaucoma in Japan. When you take away 16% for exfoliation and 16% for high tension glaucoma, the POAG that's left, and 16% oh, for angle closure, the POAG that's left is 90% what we would call normal tension glaucoma. And for years afterwards, it became very controversial with people arguing, well, the Japanese corneas are thinner, the Japanese are thinner, uh, maybe they have a, the Japanese have a lower normal intraocular pressure. But we realize now that it's, intraocular pressure exists on a spectrum. There's no cutoff point of a specific number and you can get glaucoma at virtually any pressure. So, uh, as I started to say, glaucoma can occur at any pressure, and ischemia plays an important role. Okay, ischemia is very important, and mitochondrial dysfunction. All neurodegenerative diseases have a mitochondrial dysfunctional component. Not just glaucoma, but ALS, Huntington's, uh, Alzheimer's, all tied together by the fact that mitochondria get sick and die before the neurons die. So when I see a patient with normal tension glaucoma, what we're really saying is risk factors above and beyond and outside of high tension, elevated pressure, which is the most common risk factor for glaucoma. But it's hard to say that. It takes a long time. So I'll say normal tension glaucoma, but you, when I say normal tension glaucoma, you know I mean this whole other sentence. Uh, if the patient's still progressing, a patient has a pressure of 14, these things can overlap. Patient with high pressure can still have sleep apnea, can still have low blood pressure, and that just increases the risk of progression 
and glaucoma is damaged. So if I have a patient either with normal pressure glaucoma who's progressing or a patient who's got high tension glaucoma but his pressure has been controlled to a point where it should not be progressing but still is, I get polysomnography on everybody. And I get 24-hour diurnal blood pressures. And we've written about that elsewhere. I'm not going to talk about it here. But uh, sleep apnea is a major component in, uh, in open-angle glaucoma. And so is low blood pressure. If the blood pressure dips at night too low, then you get decreased ocular perfusion. And, and you get progression of glaucoma. And one last thing to remember is that glaucoma is essentially a brain disease, okay? The optic nerve and the other structures that are affected, like the lateral geniculate, the visual cortex, they're all part of the brain. Now, the diseases that lead to elevated pressure, like exfoliation, damage the trabecular meshwork, they make the pressure go up, the pressure goes up, causes glaucoma, this damage, cupping, uh, visual field loss, but it's affecting the optic nerve. That's where the disease is really occurring that's causing the damage. And that's no different from all the other neurodegenerative diseases like Alzheimer's or ALS or Huntington's. And mitochondria, my, the ganglion, retinal ganglion cells in mitochondria are filled, in, in uh, glaucoma, are filled with mitochondria. The mitochondria die and then the retinal ganglion cells die. And it's the same for all of these diseases, and that's the very bottom portion, which we don't have time to go into here. But these are the common factors in neurodegenerative neurodegen diseases. Okay, let me wind up. Look, I've made major achievements. Here's the autobiographical part. I made major achievements. I also made mistakes. And again, for the younger people here, I want to mention some of those. I did the first valve in New York back when I was a fellow. We did the Coop and Denver valve. We did them under a trabecular flap, and they scarred down, just like a trabeculectomy scarred down. This was before 5-FU. It was before mitomycin. The flap scarred down. We tried modulating these. We took a tube, uh, a valve with a long tube that went behind the globe and we tuck it into nice, soft, squishy tenons at the back of the globe. And three weeks later, the pressure was 50 again. And we'd go back in, and all that soft tenons had turned to rock, like concrete. And we hypothesized that there was some factor in the aqueous that caused scarring in tenons. But nothing happened. We didn't follow on, up on that, and nothing really happened there for a number of years afterwards. Well, I thought that maybe if we made a flexible turtle-shaped valve, a, a, like a little compartment with holes at the top and a tube going into the eye, and tube clogged, we could press on the external portion and unclog the tube by pushing whatever was in it back into the anterior chamber. I called it the turtle. And I went around. Uh, at the Academy, the American Academy in 1981, I think it was. And I took it to about five companies, and they looked at it, and they turned it over, and they said, yeah, uh, looks nice, but nah. They said, there's six people in the country doing the surgery. Why are we going to make this complicated thing for six people? So I didn't know. I didn't know you could patent ideas. I didn't know anything about intellectual property I didn't know anything about money. Today, you go to medical school, the first thing they teach you, they, before they start talking about medicine, is they teach you about intellectual property and how to write a patent and how to set up a company and how to make money. Uh, I mean, it's really changed. But that was before my time. Uh, that's after my time. So nobody was interested. I stopped doing it. Uh, a few years later, Ahmed came out with the same model, essentially the same model valve, and he got all the credit. See, I could have had an airplane, uh, I could have had a big boat, but I didn't get anything out of it because Ahmed came up with the valve. Then when I, was, when I was a fellow also, 
We talked about scarring. We always the big, the biggest problem with trabeculectomies was scarring. And if you cut up, we decided, well, look, if you cut up the conjunctiva, you cut up the tenons, you sew it all back, you've got fibrosis, you've got growth factors coming in, you're going to get scarring. If we could find a way to operate without cutting conjunctiva, then that might decrease scarring and improve the, uh, improve the uh, success of trabeculectomy. So I thought and I thought, and I said, okay, I came up with this little idea like a spool of thread, a silicone spool of thread that would run across the trabecular meshwork. You get injected across the meshwork from the inside, and it would, the spool ends would hold it in place, and aqueous could get out the trabecular meshwork, and we haven't touched the conjunctiva, and we shouldn't get scarring. The problem was that the conjunctival insertion was about a millimeter too anterior. And we did not have the technology, nor did I have the thought, to try to get this to curve around and down and go more posteriorly. It, just didn't, occur, it didn't occur to me. That's too bad. But it was a mistake because that was the, I patented that in 1989, and that was actually the first patent for MIGS. But we wound up doing them from the outside, ab externo, because we could not get in from the inside because of the, where the conjunctival insertion was. Uh, and then 17 years later, the patent ran out. I hadn't gotten anywhere with it, so I let it slide. That was not smart. See, the smart thing would have been to keep working on it and working on it and redesigning it and finding a way to get it to work, to curve, to, and get, a, get an injector that would curve and get down into the posterior trabecular meshwork or the ciliary body and get under the conjunctiva. But I didn't have the brains to think of it. And so I let the patent slide, and within six months there were five companies coming out with what later became MIGS. They came out with the Zen, uh, people was working on the Hydras, the uh, InFocus. All of these different things started with my rivet, which I gave up on, and it's too bad I didn't keep working on it. Uh, today, you know, the first thing they teach you when you go to medical school is how to make money. Uh, okay, I did other things in my life, just to wind off here. Uh, I spent a lot of, I spent my whole life and my whole career essentially teaching in Asia and helping to start residency programs. Uh, there were some countries that had like one ophthalmologist per, per million people. I trained over 100 ophthalmologists from Asia between one-month fellowships, three-month ICO fellowships, and one-year or two-year research and clinical fellowships. Altogether, I trained about 450 people from 50 different countries in different extensive and different kinds of fellowships. Uh, when I developed iridoplasty, this was back again in 1983, we had just, I just started going to Thailand. I fell in love with Thailand. I decided I was Thai in my last life. And I started going two or three times a year. It was a great country. And they had no outside contact. They were always getting me to go to the clinic and do this and do that and teach this and do surgery. And I wasn't getting any sun. And I was only there for a few days. And I said, don't you have somebody coming through here all the time giving lectures? And they said, no. I was the only one that year from outside Thailand who came to Thailand. So that, that made me feel sad for them. That made me want to do something. So the following year, in 1985, we put together the first Thailand Ophthalmological Symposium, and I brought about six people from England and the United States. And that's where we presented. We had just finished developing iridoplasty. Rather than the Academy of Arvo, we presented the first iridoplasty lecture in the world as a warm-up in Thailand at, at the symposium there. 
And after, uh, at the end of the symposium, these people came over and they said, we think that's what Her Majesty has. And she did. Now everybody knows this story, so it's no, it's no secret, it's been published. But, uh, so the Queen of Thailand, Queen Sirikit, uh, she had had angle closure, they had done iridotomies on her, her pressures were still 30, her angles were appositionally closed. She had iridoplasties that brought her pressures down to 12, her, open, her angles for grade three, and she was okay for the next 20 years. And, and she really liked me as a result. Uh, so I wound up actually, over the next 30 years, making 120 Trans-Pacific flights. And one king tells another. So I wound up taking care of people in the government from every country from Sri Lanka to, to Japan. And I got involved in politics. Uh, and it was kind of fun, so that was kind of a second career. And so the second time, I, I was the first American to go to Laos alone, legally, uh, since the end of the Vietnam War. That was 1990. And uh, I didn't want to go alone, so I got a friend of mine from college to come with me. I'd never been to a communist country. And I, at the year, the, I started taking care of the president, uh, who had a pressure of 38, 95% cups and never knew it because he never had an eye exam. And he refused to go to Bangkok. He refused to do anything. Uh, and he was my first mass killer patient. He had killed about a quarter of a million people. He had been head of the Bethet Lao. And he was not a nice guy. But fortunately, uh, he died soon after. And I went back to T Laos the next year and I was taking care of the prime minister. Now at that point, I was taking care of the Prime Minister of Laos and, uh, and Thailand. And I said, look, Poon, the, the Vietnamese, they're not your people. The Cambodians are not your people. The Thai people, Lao people, all the same people, Isan people. Uh, they were having a border war. They were having a border war over some Hill 273 or something like that. I said, look, you're my patient, and is my patient. I don't want my patients to fight with each other. Why don't you go to Bangkok and kiss and make up? And so he went down to Bangkok, and they signed the treaty, and they built the Thai Lao Friendship Bridge, which was the first road between the two countries. I never got mentioned. They made a big deal of it, but I, I didn't know about, just like I didn't know about patents, I didn't know too much about publicity either. So. I could have gotten a Nobel Peace Prize, but nobody ever heard my name. So it, what, what was the difference? Uh, and then in New York, uh, I was taking care of two Cambodian ambassadors who were deadly enemies from either side of the Cambodian War uh, in my office, and I booked their appointments on the same day. And they were sitting opposite in, in the waiting room, and just for fun, I booked their appointments on the same day the next time. And they started moving closer to each other, and then they started talking. And then they booked their appointments all the time on the same day. And one day, Ali Alatas, who was the ambassador of Indonesia, came in just by accident. And then there's the, th the three of them were talking. And Ali went back a couple months later to Indonesia to become foreign minister. And two months after that, a front page of the New York Times, here's a picture of the three of them in Jakarta having peace talks for Cambodia. Uh, again, my name didn't get mentioned. <laughs> so that was about it. Well, I'm, I'm running out of time here, so I'm going to end here. Look, I've given you a brief synopsis of my life with successes and mistakes. And the one thing to remember, and again, for the younger people, especially in the audience, that if you have an idea and you think it's good, then follow it through. If you don't happen to do it and it works, that somebody else does it, you're going to remember it for the rest of your life. If you do it and it works, you're going to feel great and remember it for the rest of your life. And if you do it and it doesn't work, so you, know, you tried. You did what you had in your mind. You did what you believed in. If it didn't work, either find a way to make it work or go on to something else. But don't let 
people tell you that whatever idea you have is worthless and not worth doing and stupid because you don't know if they know. Uh, and so that's really pretty much about it. Uh, I had one more picture, I don't know where it is. Yeah, so remember, oh yeah. So the, and the final thing to remember is that glaucoma is essentially a brain disease. When you get it in the eye and the pressure goes up, it's affecting the brain. It's a brain disease, and all the things that are going to affect and work on brain diseases, and I use a lot of supplements, ginkgo, curcumin, alpha-lipoic acid. Uh, now you've got nicotinamide, vitamin B3, nucleoside riboside. All of these things that are neuroprotective for mice should work in people. And anything that's neuroprotective for one of these neurodegenerative disorders should work on other ones. So if you discover something that's going to cure glaucoma by preventing mitochondrial cell death, and I use a lot of mitochondrial protectants and a lot of, uh, a lot of other neuroprotectants, that if you cure one disease, you have a chance of curing the other diseases altogether. So thank you again once, a day, once again for this honor today and for your attention. Vicerrector de Investigación y Transferencia, Secretaria General, Dr. Reitz, Dr. Teus, miembros del equipo de gobierno, decanos, directores de escuela y presidenta del Consejo de Estudiantes, miembros de la comunidad universitaria, presidente de la Sociedad de Condueños, Señoras y señores, tanto los presentes en la sala como aquellos que nos siguen en directo a través de nuestro canal oficial de YouTube. Les doy la bienvenida a este solemne acto que celebramos y por el que la Universidad de Alcalá enriquece su claustro con la incorporación por causa de honor de Robert Rich, una autoridad mundial en su ámbito del conocimiento. Como ha mencionado el profesor Teus, una leyenda en su tema de investigación en el glaucoma. Agradezco al profesor Miguel Ángel Teus su brillante laudatio sobre el profesor Rich. Con esta ceremonia, que responde a una larga tradición, la Universidad de Alcalá reconoce el mérito de la extraordinaria trayectoria de Robert Rich, quien se ha consolidado como una figura aclamada internacionalmente por sus avances en la investigación diagnóstico y tratamiento del glaucoma, 
uno de los grandes retos globales de salud pública, pues se trata de la primera causa de ceguera irreversible en el mundo. Con su dedicación, Robert Rich contribuye a mejorar la calidad de vida de buena parte de nuestra población. Se estima que en 2040 la prevalencia del glaucoma superará los 110 millones de personas en el mundo. De esta forma, su trabajo facilita un mayor bienestar en el seno de la colectividad a la que sirve esta universidad, la Universidad de Alcalá. Más allá de sus destacables logros profesionales, valoramos las virtudes que le han ayudado a conseguirlos. Pues, como dijo Santiago Ramón y Cajal, en su discurso de ingreso a la Real Academia de la Ciencia, toda obra grande, en arte como en ciencia, es el resultado de una gran pasión puesta al servicio de una gran idea. Y la senda tomada por Robert Rich, cuyos detalles hemos escuchado en su laudatio, desprende entusiasmo por explorar nuevos caminos, vocación, tenacidad y sacrificio en el trabajo. Y una generosidad indiscutible a la hora de compartir y divulgar sus conocimientos, capaz de despertar vocaciones entre sus discípulos y lectores, como recordaba el propio Miguel Ángel Teus, y de sembrar de esta forma la semilla de futuros avances en su campo de conocimiento. Para la Universidad de Alcalá supone un enorme honor contar en su claustro con figuras tan valiosas como Robert Rich, en especial en estos momentos en los que impera la confusión, el desconcierto y nos amenazan plagas como la pandemia COVID-19, que están castigando a nuestra sociedad y cuyas consecuencias afectan a todos los ámbitos de la actividad humana. En nuestro interés por cumplir con nuestro mandato social del que esta institución es consciente desde su fundación hace ya más de 500 años, las universidades generamos y difundimos el conocimiento. Y parafraseando de nuevo a Ramón y Cajal, esta vez en su discurso sobre la psicología de Don Quijote y el quijotismo, necesitamos que soñadores que cuando aspiren a realizar sus ensueños aporten claves nuevas para solucionar los problemas de cada tiempo y progresar hacia una vida cada vez más digna y feliz y un mundo en el que prevalezcan los grandes valores cívicos y los derechos humanos sean accesibles para toda la población. Reitero mi felicitación personal e institucional a Robert Rich por su nombramiento por causa de honor. Y lo hago con agradecimiento porque al incorporarse a nuestro claustro nos hace crecer como institución a los ojos del mundo por mejorar en la investigación de vanguardia, en la formación de excelencia y en la contribución al bienestar de las personas y de la sociedad. Concluyo mi intervención convencido de lo más valioso, el calor humano de Robert Rich, con el que sin duda se esfuerza como haría el médico de José Saramago en su ensayo sobre la ceguera, en mirar a los ojos de los demás como si estuviera viéndoles el alma. Muchas gracias, Robert. Muchas gracias a todos los asistentes.
Se levanta la sesión.